webinar series. Uh, we've been doing this for a good part of a year now, and I am delighted that we are now going to do Edith Wharton's Age of Innocence. Now, we are um, honored by having three professors of uh, note. I'm going to briefly give you their biographies, um, briefly. Uh, Dr. Sheila Liming is an associate professor at Champlain College in Burlington, Vermont. Um, author of, among other things, What a Library Means to a Women, Woman and Office, a, a third book, Hanging Out is Forthcoming, and she is an editor of a new version of Wharton's novel, Age of Innocence, uh, for Norton, just out in June 2022. Dr. Carol Singley is professor of English at Rutgers University Camden and general editor of the 30 volume, The Complete Works of Edith Wharton, ongoing publication, internationally known scholar of Edith Wharton. Um, um, oh, there, there's just an extraordinary bibliography here, but among other things, uh, Edith Wharton, Matters of Mind and Spirit. And, uh, oh gosh, I mean, she is the person you go to to find out about Edith Wharton. Um, Dr. Candace Wade is professor of English at the University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, where she is also affiliated with the Comparative Literature Program. Her books include Edith Wharton's Letters from the Underworld, colon, Fictions of Women and Writing. Now, there are a great many other publications by all of our authors. They will appear in the chat or Q&A button below with Amazon links. Please go at once, buy everything they've ever written <laughs> um, immediately and, and, and then pass on the word to your friends. Now, the chat and Q&A buttons. The format is we'll have three talks, you know, conversational, informal, et cetera, uh, from our three professors in alphabetical order by last name. Uh, we then have the Q&A. Uh, this is questions by you, the audience. Please put your questions into the chat and Q&A buttons. They can be answered by the professors during the discussion period who can also just riff and talk with each other. My responsibility is to pass on your questions in whatever order I think makes for a fun conversation, not chronologically. If by any chance your question does not get answered in, by the end of our session here, don't worry. Send me email, randall at nas.org, R-A-N-D-A-L-L at nas.org. I will forward your questions to the panelists so they can answer you. Um, you will get your questions answered no matter what. And if you have to leave suddenly, this is going is being recorded and it will be available on the National Association of Scholars YouTube channel within 24 hours for perpetuity. You'll be able to see this and again, show it to your friends. So I think that answers all the questions you might have about Edith Wharton's Age of Innocence and you know, why is it to be considered a great American novel? I mean, it's just really good and wonderful to read is obviously the answer, but you're going to get it in more detailed uh, versions now. And I believe that's uh, Dr. Liming first, if I remember my alphabet. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you for the introduction, David. And I'm happy to start things off here. Um, I'm going to talk very informally just along the lines of some questions or some prompts um, that I was asked to think about uh, in relation to the Age of Innocence. And then um, my fellow panelists are going to follow up. And if you have not read the Age of Innocence, you're definitely going to want to by the end of this session. <laughs> I think that's our secondary goal here. Um, but I am presuming that probably many of the people in the audience are pretty familiar with the uh, plot of the book at this point in time. And I'm happy to answer any questions that don't make sense later on if you're not um, one of the central questions that we were asked to kind of consider is what makes The Age of Innocence by Edith Wharton a great American novel? And that's a phrase that Wharton herself was um, familiar with and something that she thought about a lot um, and wrote, wrote about during her own lifetime as we were thinking about, you know, how do novels pass into the hands of what we would consider classics? And one of the things that I think makes The Age of Innocence a great American novel is that it rewards rereading and returning to. And this actually has to do with the way 
it's set up and written by Wharton, that it rewards those returns over and over again. I think a good novel is something that we read, maybe we enjoy the story, we walk away from, we put it on the shelf, maybe we pass it along to a friend, I'm always giving novels to my dad, we pass it off to somebody else and then maybe we kind of forget about it. But a great novel is one that we plan to return to, we hope to return to, we want to return to. And every time we come back to it, it's a slightly different book than the last time we encountered it. And that's been the case for me in reading The Age of Innocence. Um, as David introduced or mentioned in the beginning, um, I recently was working on uh, a new edition of The Age of Innocence uh, for W.W. Norton. And this was supposed to be marketed as a kind of popular critical edition, sort of spanning the two. So, um, you know, useful footnotes and research and things like that folded into an edition that might be used in, say, a college classroom or maybe even a high school classroom. So that was my kind of project. And as I got started on that, which I began about two years ago, I began with the project of reading The Age of Innocence again, and I read it one page a day. So my thought was that I was going to take it really, really slow. I'd read this book several times before, but I wanted to slow it all down and really spend some time with Wharton's language and her words and let it all sort of sink in in ways that maybe I hadn't been able to afford to do in the past. So I started on this project of reading the novel a page a day, which of course, since it's a decently long book, took me about a year to do, um, and it was a lot of fun. And one of the things that I realized in that return reading was that it was not the book that I remembered. I actually felt like I saw this secondary plot emerge that I don't even remember being there the first time I read it. And the first time I read it was probably 15 years ago. And so part of what makes it such a great American novel is that it has multiple stories to tell. Um, and the stories appear braided together there. And for instance, I think one of the most intriguing stories in The Age of Innocence is the question of what do many of the characters want, especially the characters that we're not allowed to get to know. So in the book, we are mostly exposed to the viewpoint of just one character, and that is Wharton's effective protagonist, Newland Archer. We see inside his thoughts, we see inside his yearnings, his desires. We get not a crystal clear portrait because Newland spends some time lying to himself, but we get at least a detailed portrait um, of what's going on inside his head. But we do not get access to the thoughts of characters like May, his wife, or like Ellen, who is his object of desire. And a lot of times we are sort of encouraged by Wharton to presume that we know what these characters want because Newland thinks he knows what they want. But that doesn't mean it's what they want. That is just sort of what we are shown. It's very tricky and it's very crafty on Wharton's part. And it's sort of what makes the novel so fun to revisit as we kind of do that detective work. So one of the questions that I've always been intrigued with with this novel that kind of comes out to the fore in these returns and these rereadings is, at what point in time does May Welland know of Newland Archer's feelings for Ellen Olenska, her cousin? Because there are various points in the novel where it is hinted. You can almost get a feeling that May is like just on the verge of saying something or just on the verge of figuring out what's going on, even as Newland himself is figuring it out, because it takes him a while to figure out his feelings too. And it's a really intriguing question because what May knows or doesn't know completely changes your reading of the second half of the book. If May knows about what's going on between Newland and his feelings for Ellen Olenska, then the second half of the book is not about innocence, which is the word that he loves to attach to her, it is about retaliation. And suddenly May appears like the least innocent character in the entire book, as opposed to the most innocent character in the book, which is what Newland supposedly likes her for. So I find that very interesting. Um, and that's a question that really drives my return to the novel when I do get to return to it, is trying to figure out what May knows and when she knows it. And Wharton is never explicit in telling us this, but she gives us little nudges that we can kind of work through. Um, one of the other questions I was asked to consider here today is the question of what does innocence mean in the age of innocence? And my kind of short answer to that is that innocence itself in this novel is a scarce commodity if it exists at all. Um, most of the people that we see in it are not innocent at all, um, save for perhaps the character who courts the most scandal, and that is Ellen Olenska herself. Not quite innocent by any means, but perhaps if we're looking at this along a spectrum of behavior, um, she ends up looking more innocent than many of the other characters who end up acting against her. And this is ironic, of course, because Ellen is the one who sets all the scandal and all the controversy into motion. When she shows up in the first chapter, 
she begins to disrupt a very careful architecture that has been put in place by the society that she's entering into, which is the society of 1870s New York. So she shows up at the opera. Newland is newly engaged to May. He's about to take a new step down this path towards becoming like a virtuous and serious citizen through his marriage and also through the bonding of these two important families. And Ellen kind of throws a bomb into that whole situation. She doesn't mean to, it's not her intention, but she does. And then the controversy kind of spills out all over the place. This is despite the fact that as the book goes on, Ellen is revealed to be perhaps one of the more innocent characters, one of the least scheming, one of the least villainous of them all. Um, but nevertheless, the one who kind of gets that controversy going. So I think Wharton's fascination with innocence in this book has to do with the fact that it's almost non-existent among the people that she is documenting. Wharton was um, sort of inspired not just by her own memories of New York in the 1870s. She was born in the early 1860s, so didn't really experience that from a fully conscious perspective, but has some kind of memories of it as she documents in her various autobiographies. Um, but she was also inspired, of course, by what she heard about that time period from her parents and her relatives and by other people who had witnessed it. And writing from the vantage point of the late 1910s, and the novel comes out in 1920, she's looking back on that period and thinking about how maybe some of the machinations of that period in the 1870s set into motion some of the less innocent behavior to be found in the modern century in her own time period. Um, and so, you know, when she was writing the book, we're coming out of World War I, we're moving towards the 1920s, which is going to be a whole different kettle of fish, socially speaking, and all kinds of social structures are going to be on the table and being debated and, and pushed against. So she writes this novel about people sort of pushing against time. And that's one thing that the character Ellen Olenska is doing. She is too modern for the world that she lives in, in the 1870s. And as a result, she has to sort of bide her time and wait for the rest of the world to catch up with her, but they're not going to. Um, it's going to be too late by the time they do. And that's part of the innocent quality that she has um, in the novel. Um, and just a couple more points to add here. I was also asked to think about Wharton's influences and then in turn, who she ended up influencing later on, which is a question that I really enjoy um, thinking about because I spent a lot of time working with Wharton's library collection, which is housed at the Mount Estate in Lenox, Massachusetts, her historic home. Um, Wharton's in influences are all over this book. Um, in particular, I'm always picking up on the influences of the realist novel tradition. So that is a tradition that leads back necessarily to France. And I see pieces of writers like Balzac in this book, whose human comedy was very important at the beginning of the 19th century in trying to document French life as it was, especially um, where the conflict between various social classes was involved. So I see some of that in there. And then also, Wharton enjoys naming her influences in pretty direct terms at various points in the novel. For instance, at one point in the novel, she has a scene where Newland is unpacking a crate of books that he has just bought and they're new titles. And one of the books that he takes out of the crate is this new novel that people are talking about that's called Middlemarch by a British writer called George Eliot. And so that's another kind of influence that we can think about for Wharton. Remember, she wrote this book 50 years later, but in the time setting of the book, Middlemarch is a new book. Um, so she's clearly thinking about George Eliot and that tradition, um, British literary realism as well. And then there's also little sprinklings of poetry and other kinds of influences in there too. Um, just recently upon my rereading of The Age of Innocence, I picked up on Wharton's use of a little, just tiny scrap of a phrase, the dazzle of the day, which recalls a line from one of her favorite poets, which is Walt Whitman, um, who has a line about the dazzle of the day in his Leaves of Grass work. And so you can see her kind of threading her book with these influences and gestures towards the uh, literary heroes that filled up her library as well. And then on the other side of it, I'm very interested in who has uh, claimed to have been influenced by Wharton, especially amongst contemporary authors and contemporary literature. Um, a very famous one in uh, contemporary American literature is the author Jonathan Franzen, who's made quite a lot of his um, debt that he has to Edith Wharton as an author and as one of the biggest voices of literary realism in the 20th century. Franzen sort of continues the realist tradition these days, and you might even say that he's writing Edith Wharton novels that take place now. Um, that's sort of like his approach to the genre of realism or the mode of literary realism. And some others are in there too. 
Um, recently, writers like Roxane Gay and Brandon L. Taylor, they talk a lot about their influence, um, about being influenced by Wharton as well, too. And these are not writers that maybe at first glance you would immediately associate with Wharton, which is what I find so fascinating about that, um, that we still see her name in conversation, that we still see modern writers looking back and referring to her as a model of what works for them um, in the realistic novel. So I want to conclude there just because I want to give plenty of space for my other panelists to go ahead and jump in here. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Singley, uh, next to the alphabetical order, would you be so kind? Yes, I'm. thank you very much, David. Thanks for inviting me to be part of this panel. And I'm honored to be with Sheila and Candace, two esteemed Wharton scholars. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity for me. The uh, comments I want to make will, I think, align uh, in some interesting ways with things that Sheila has already said. And uh, let me begin by saying that um, I prefer The Age of Innocence to any of Wharton's 25 novels. And I think she is one of our greatest American writers. She has amazing powers of observation, and she couples those observations with wit and irony. And all this in a realist tradition, as Sheila mentioned, um, such that she is an exquisite chronicler of her time. Um, it's that fact of being of her time that has been a double-edged sword for Wharton as there have been decades in the 20th century when she has been pigeonholed. This is no longer the case, and we can see her reputation soaring where I think it deserves to be, and I hope it will stay. So here we are 100 years later, and we're reading The Age of Innocence. It is still popular, and why is that? So that's the question I wanna take on. Does the novel live? It certainly does. Why is it important? So I wanna suggest three reasons. Um, one will be historical detail. Two is love story. And three is a theme of change. Um, the historical detail in The Age of Innocence is astounding. Wharton wrote this novel mostly from memory. And the way she captures the decor, draperies, furniture, foyers, dishes, dinner parties, and social customs is exquisite. She also writes the novel, as Sheila mentioned, retrospectively. She was in her 50s when she published it, the same age that Ron, um, Newland Archer is when he's reviewing his life. And so this retrospective is doubled in the novel, making it quite interesting. Critics debate whether her backward glance, and I'm thankful that Sheila brought Whitman in because a backward glance is the title of Wharton's autobiography. And she borrowed this phrase from Whitman, whom she loved. Is this backward glance nostalgic or critical? I think the answer is both. It's an homage and it's a critique. Wharton respects history, but only to a point. And I'll explain that a little bit. The second thing that I think is riveting about this novel is the love story. It is a uh, tale that makes our hearts ache as we watch Newland Archer, Mae Wellen, and Ellen Olenska work out their attractions. Wharton positions Archer between two women, very different women. And she often does in her fiction have contrasting pairs. So here on the one hand, we have the athletic May. Archer assumes that she is an ingenue, an innocent, if you will, naive, and therefore malleable. But boy, is he wrong. She is actually the one who orchestrates his life as well as her own. But in the novel, Wharton reaches to classical mythology and she compares May to the goddess Diana or Artemis, who is the goddess of the hunt. And you'll remember that May wins the archery contest. <clears throat> she hits her mark. 
and that mark is Archer. She's the goddess of fertility, motherhood, and solidarity with family and constancy and the continuation of the race. She's wearing white shades of cool colors like blue. She carries lilies of the valley, underlining a certain kind of purity, which again is a little bit of a ruse. We have on the other hand, Helen. She evokes Helen, the Greek Helen of Troy, with a sensual beauty powerful enough to launch ships and start wars. She's always associated with yellows and reds, darker colors, richness. She brings the rich culture of Europe to an Americanized New York society. She's creative like May, but in an artistic sense, she's surrounded by things like painting, music, dance. Ellen lacks the traditional family structure that May has, but she shows herself to be very caring, very generous. In addition to being a love interest for Archer, I think she also presents a kind of platonic ideal. She helps Archer question his complacent views about New York society. She asks him to examine hypocrisies. And ultimately, she is honorable because she leaves New York when May precipitously announces her pregnancy, plotting, really, to get rid of Ellen. So now we go to Archer. Here he is at the opening of the novel, a slave to convention, a creature of habit. Whether it's using two hairbrushes putting a gardenia in his lapel and arriving fashionably late at the opera. Wharton writes about him, and I think this is one of the most damning phrases in her work. Few things seemed more awful than an offense against taste. There are things more awful than offenses against taste. Archer thinks of himself as sophisticated, who buys the latest books as Sheila Lyming has suggested. But ultimately, he's pretty conservative in his choices. It's Ellen who's original, not Archer. He hesitates every step of the way, lacking the courage to pursue his heart's desire. And so by the end of his life, Wharton writes that he has missed the flower of life. So that brings me to the third theme, which is change. And it took me reading the novel several times before this theme emerged for me as the key point that Wharton is sharing here. We know that Archer follows traditions and he fails to become a hero of his own life. But Wharton shows us in this novel that it is possible to break away from codified societal norms, if only you have the will to do so. And let me mention two characters who represent them. First of all, there is Archer's son, Dallas. He invites Archer to Paris, where he can reunite with Ellen. But Archer chooses to stay on the bench and look up. Dallas is engaged to Fanny Beaufort, who is the daughter of Julius Beaufort, the scandalous businessman no one wanted to associate. But now, no one cares. No one cares about his scandalous business practices. Beauforts are part of society. Norms change, Wharton shows us, and they should. There's a smaller detail of the plot. You might remember the story of Catherine Mingott, the grand matriarch of New York society. When Catherine was a small child, her father, Bob Spicer, ran off with a Spanish dancer, taking with him a large sum of money and scandalizing New York and discrediting the family. He was never heard of again. Catherine Mingott recovered. She married her daughters well and she rules New York, building that house in the inaccessible wilderness of Central Park. 
daring to be different. She even eggs Archer on. She says to him, why didn't you marry my little Ellen? She says that only Ellen has the family's wicked blood. You'll remember when Archer goes to Fall River, Massachusetts to see Ellen. He's carrying a ship timetable and a newspaper. Could it be that he plans to escape? He does, he never makes good on his plans. He never acts, he drifts. And so he ends up in a compromise with life rather than a champion of life. And so we've been asking, why is the novel important? What does it mean? And I guess I have to ask, is his story tragic? Or is it merely pathetic? Wharton sometimes writes about waste, not tragedy. So on the positive side, Archer lives a good life, a decent life, does the right thing, gets married, he has children. He even has a stint as an elected official in public office when Roosevelt asks him to serve. But he always equivocates. He says, there was good in the old ways. He says, there was good in the new order too. He, to my mind, is not the American individualist hero that we look for in American literature. Ellen, if anyone, is the hero here. More honest, more proactive and independent. And as Archer sits looking up at the light in the window in her balcony, he's looking up at the true source of elimination. Wharton quoted William Dean Howes in saying that Americans want a tragedy with a happy ending. Wharton, a realist, refuses the happy ending. Her characters often have to settle, pay for pleasure. But Wharton is enthusiastic about one thing, and that is moving forward, embracing change. She loved technology. She had the latest automobiles and elevators. She constantly traveled. She opened herself to new horizons. She dared to divorce when it was unpopular um, to do so. And this to me is the novel's message. And it's a great message for the modern era Wharton was a part of and for now, our digital age. It's important to embrace change because change is our reality. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, wonderful to hear that. And I'm going to go straight on to Dr. Wade. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, I've been rereading The Age of Innocence and happy to be with it again, and in every paragraph, the irony, the slicing irony, and the untowardness that is Wharton's humor uh, that comes, which comes through. Um, the Age of Innocence is part of Wharton's trilogy, and pardon me for my Zoom sliding, uh, part of Wharton's trilogy, and it's surprising how late Wharton was canonized how late, how long it took for a woman to make it into the canon. The first uh, book that made it into Yale's program was uh, The House of Mirth. I chose it because I thought it would be most helpful for the, uh, for the undergraduates. I did not teach it. Uh, it was for Dick Broadhead when he was teaching the post-1865. The next author who made it in uh, was with Amy Kaplan, and I advised her to put in um, Sarah Orne Jewett's Country of the Pointed Furs, not the Cather edition with all of the things stuffed up in it, but the very well-balanced, beautiful piece uh, that predicts Eudora Welty. So today, I, I think about 1920, and uh, of course, we all remember there was a paper shortage then because of World War I, and Wharton early had a paper shortage. She wrote her first novel about the 1970s. Sorry, 
that was she did uh, did write novels in the 1970s, but they were by other people. Uh, the uh, 1870s. It was called Fast and Loose. She finished it when she was 15. It was a sentimental novel that closed with the flowers on Georgie's grave, uh, and she wrote it on foolscap. She wrote it on wrapping paper. Those were the kinds of materials that she had. Some people would think that because Wharton was part of an elite society, such a, a small world aristocracy, uh, that she even once reports in um, a backward glance about having been asked to meet herself <laughs> as one of the, the bohemian artists to journalist and herself. So that we see fast and loose her novel of 1870s, that she was writing so much from memory. She did have to do research, as Sheila points out, but I think she knew that uh, cucumbers could not be cut with uh, certain metals, that it left flavors, and that this is a way of seeing the detail of the age of innocence, right? So that uh, she later on, uh, having rewritten her juvenilia in this beautiful form of the Age of Innocence, she went on to care more about the raucous girls, the buccaneers, the pirates coming from America, some kind of joy in what it might mean to be an American abroad. And this was her buccaneers, the novel she did not finish, the novel that she was at work on at the time of her death. So Wharton had a good deal to say about the great American novel she wrote in response to Howells and James Fenimore Cooper. And the question was whether there was something to write about in relation to America, which is kind of vain for James Fenimore Cooper who was writing about, uh, who was writing about Native American life or tried to uh, present those uh, characters. So Wharton, in response to that, it was published in 1927 in the Yale Review, written in 1926. She talked about human nature and her word is denuded. Uh, we might call that naked now. What does naked human nature consist of? And, and sh her answer is nothing without the culture that has spider web spun it about itself. Uh, she um, is quite critical of the concept of man with a capital letter. Uh, to speak to Carol, <laughs> taste and form have capital letters. Uh, folly in the age of innocence has children, but it does not have a capital letter. So I, I so interested in what you all were saying. So she, she thinks about man with a capital letter and those demagogues of the 18th century. I think she speaks there of Rousseau and Voltaire who play largely in her work in terms of, uh, and, and she blames them for what's known as standardization or the RTW ready to wear movement, which was happening in her lifetime. So that she thinks that about climate, these are her words, climate, soil, religion, wealth, and above all leisure as making this world, which she constructs detail by detail, flavor by flavor across every cucumber in this novel, as well as the reference to cucumbers in Ethan Frome. So in the age of innocence, Wharton was rewriting the tragedy of the house of mirth, um, the abomination, of the custom of the country. These are the names of her New York trilogy. And she was rewriting um, again in rewriting a tragedy, a tragedy as Carol says about change and about recognition of change and recognition that these forms are what is holding it together uh, in the age of innocence. So I agree that Ellen is the hero of the novel, even though um, Newland is the one that hears other people's thoughts and he hears them in capital letters. He hears the unspoken in capital letters and the unspoken becomes most charged when words are not given to it. And that's in his relationship uh, with Ellen 
Olenska, which is a relationship that goes on as she thrones in this library and an altar and an altar that he keeps there. Ellen says at their lunch, after they take one of the boats in the book, it seems stupid to have discovered America to make it into a copy of another country, close quote. She smiled across the table. Do you suppose Christopher Columbus would have taken all that trouble just to go to the opera with the Selfridge Marys? Uh, Mrs. Manson Minga uh, references, um, refers to Christopher Columbus as well. And her comment is that before Christopher Columbus came, nobody thought of living above the battery. Of course, many people were living above the battery and uh, Wharton knew this. So that summer in 1917 is a rewriting of Ethan Frome and the Age of Innocence is a rewriting of so much. Uh, it's elegiac, it's peacemaking, it's wicked and incisive, and it's very funny. It's very funny. The delight in breaking form and departures from good taste uh, are Wharton's incisive humor, bring Wharton's incisive humor. So I wanted to just mention what it's like for Newton. Um, I'm sorry. I'm thinking about the Fig Newtons in Boston, hoping I'm speaking to some Bostonians here, for Newland uh, to get off the train in Boston. And these wonderful one sentence, um, these wonderful one sentence uh, statements that we have uh, in the Age of Innocence. So as you might imagine, um, having once known the novel by heart, <laughs> I now need to find papers to quote from it. But what, what the line is about is about getting out into the smells of Boston, the crush and the heat of Boston. And Wharton finishes her sentence saying, with the intimacy of boarding house people on the way to the toilet. This is not an unusual sentence in the age of innocence. Uh, Mrs. Lemuel Struthers, or Strut Hers, as I read it, uh, who's uh, formerly, um, because of her black hair, has been an heiress of a, of a shoe polish, well, a wife heiress of a shoe polish company. Her gorgeous black hair comes from a saloon at the pit of a mine. Uh, this is the sort of excavation that goes on of other people and people who are coming in to make this change in New York and the apocryphal 400. The 400 was and is a myth um, uh, that was very useful at the time to talk about how few people could be in New York society ways to control it and keep it at that number of 400, the New York 400. So I want to give everyone time to speak and I have a great deal to say about the Age of Innocence. Reading Wharton this time, having read it so many times and once having lived the novel, looking for things like hoardings and trying to figure out that those are, are bill postings down where Mrs. Manson Mingott has decided to live. I think of Mrs. Manson Mingott as this powerful figure in the novel, uh, and she is, she's one of the deal makers who causes things to happen. The other is Ellen Olinska, the, the precipitate uh, nature of that, as is Ellen. Mrs. Manson Mingott has an adipose chuckle. Who uses fat to describe laughter? Edith Wharton does. These, this is remarkable prose, uh, as is the prose from all of the New York trilogy. People who were trying to put Wharton in her place said that the New York trilogy is Edith Wharton's regional novel. These are Edith Wharton's regional saga. Uh, and they were trying to say that that's where she belonged. But in reading The Age of Innocence, we realized that she has so much 
perception, so much perception about inclusion, exclusion, uh, what it means to know things by rote, why May, instead of reading a new book of poems, chooses to recite from memory. The desperate holding on to rote knowledge, rote custom, rote ways of being, uh, which w Wharton already knew was breaking in the pre-World War I uh, modernity and Wharton's modernity itself. So she, malgré elle, uh, my Alabama French, um, in spite of herself, is a major modernist. She's a major, major modernist in temporality, and she's a major modernist in works such as the middle part of the New York trilogy, The Custom of the Country. If you have not read these, I suggest you read them all. Um, in The Custom of the Country, she, there's a trashy line, when the kissing had to stop. It turns out to be from an elegant poem by Browning. So it's the idea there that the culture is already a phantom society, that it's already been picked to pieces and put back together. In the age of innocence, she finds the font of creativity as Carol Singley says today that is that breaking apart of change that comes and through the breaking apart of things, creativity or, or as Bergson says, creative evolution at last becomes possible. And it's that breaking apart, that welcoming of Debussy, of the Grand Guignol, uh, of that new world that Fanny and Dallas offer to bring her to. What Newland cannot stand, what can, he cannot face is the eyes Ellen Olinska's eyes and the light that those eyes have seen, the poems that those eyes have read alongside his in some instances, he cannot bear to see her eyes. And it's Ellen that says the Gorgon is the moment where one's eyes are propped open so that one is forced to see everything. Wharton sees everything. There may not be a great American novel. Uh, there certainly won't be the great American novel because America is a fiction and it's been made. And it is that making and unmaking that Wharton covers with such brilliance, audacity, <laughs> humor, and wicked wit, wicked wit in the New York trilogy. So the age of innocence, we've talked a lot about innocence. I'm ready to hear what the people who are listening to us have to say. Uh, thank you all. And thank you so much. Yes, there's clapping I'm seeing from various uh, panel members. Thank you. So I'm going to encourage everybody to put more questions into Q&A and chat. Now, there are actually, there's a question or two already, but I, I guess I do want to have one. You, you were talking about, you know, Wharton being dismissed as a regional novelist. And I guess I want to sort of take that up without the question of dismissal. Um, to the audience in 1920, when this is published, how much is this an evocation of a strange society culture as opposed to one that's already known? And I, I, comparisons are horrible, but is New York society circa 1870 stranger to the audience in 1920 than Willa Cather's pioneers in My Antonia in 1918. Are they equally new, new, equally eccentric from the mainstream American reader? And I guess this is getting to how much of her artistry is focused on evoking a at least semi-strange world to the intended reader. I, I can answer that first, and then the other panelists, of yeah. course, will yeah. have something to say. Yeah. 
he speaks of this being a primitive society with primitive rituals uh, because of the order and form. Um, Cather, um, do you mind if I digress? Go for it. <laughs> Everyone has the liberty to digress. Cather won the Pulitzer for one of her worst books in 1923. She won it for Lifetime Achievement. I think that's the way that we can look at that. Uh, Wharton won it for The Custom of the Country in 2013. I'm sorry, I'm, I just keep, I'm so happy to have been in the 21st century and to have been isolated for all these years now. Um, so, in, so in 1913, The Custom of the Country was published. Uh, Wharton won. Wharton received the Pulitzer Prize, but they withdrew it from her because it was too critical of the Midwest. Catherine invented the Midwest in uh, the work you just referenced, uh, one of her finest uh, works. You say, My Antonia. I say my Antonia. Uh, Let's call the whole thing off. It off. All right. So what we have to see is some kind of conservatism for, um, I, I think she certainly deserved it uh, for the age of innocence and that the book deserves it. She already deserved it in 1913 with the custom of the country. Sinclair Lewis's Main Street as the uh, novel that spoke to a more positive middle America. And, and the Midwest is what's at question here uh, from your question. Um, it, it was the, the book that won and Sinclair Lewis apologized to Wharton. So that's part of the history of the Pulitzer. Um, over and out as we say in Zoom land. Um, just going off on what you said about the anthropology, that Wharton, I think, is reflecting the age of anthropology that is part of the 20th century and the awareness of the study of cultures. And she's starting to see her own childhood culture through the lens of an anthropologist. And that gives her a certain distance. <clears throat> and it also tunes her into the time because these are the ages of of, of the great anthropologists of our, of our time just forming. So this hieroglyphic society has to be deciphered. They never say anything, they mean it. You have to figure out what they mean. And uh, that's one of the ways in which it's a very modern novel as well. Sheila, you will speak soon. I, I, feel I need I'll to. speak really quickly. I just have one thing to say, which is that um, if The Age of Innocence were written today, it would be about the early 1970s, right? That's the same time span. And um, just the other night, I was watching the new P.T. Anderson film, Licorice Pizza, which is about the 1970s, right? This is, this is an impulse that we see in our culture right now, looking back in a similar fashion to what Wharton's doing in The Age of Innocence upon that period of her own kind of gestation and then trying to document the impulses that she saw there. And so, sorry, Dr. Wade, did you want to say something more than it, it was just one thing and it, it, it was so interruptive. It's just that Franz Boas put 90% of the chairs in anthropology departments um, between the 20s and the 30s. And so what, what Carol is, is talking about is an extreme form of a 19th century discipline being institutionalized at that very moment. So it, and Wharton is, Wharton is so well read. It, at the time that I was working on my book, we were just opening, the archives had just opened. People were excitedly running across to each other. The letters had not been translated from her writing that looks like um, sort of a doodle of the Pacific Ocean by William Faulkner. So Wharton was influenced by everything she read, newspapers, Wilkie Collins, biographies of Goethe, and I'm about to say something mean, uh, by um, George Eliot's husband. <laughs> I, I know his name, Luz, but it was just fun to say that after what Sheila said. So that, and going forward, her influence on Cather in the professor's house, uh, on 
Faulkner in multiple works, including As I Lay Dying, uh, her building of a Yakna Patakfa <laughs> of New York um, influenced, you find her influences in Louise Erdrich. Wharton is a major figure who it writes in a way that influences people, that draws them in, that makes them, as my colleagues have said, makes us, as my colleagues have said, all of us want to reread because it's a different book each time. That, that, um, so that was to speak to influence. I think I'm, I'm done now. I mean, it, it would be to speak about her influence is to, um, would be to fan outward in such a large way from 1920. One of her, mm -hmm. I have been, in reading The Age of Innocence, I reread Emily Dickinson's um, Renunciation is a Piercing Virtue. Mm -hmm. And it gives the plot of The Age of Innocence. If you're looking for the deep moral plot of The Age yeah. of Innocence, it's 1929, um, Emily, Emily Dickinson, I say 1929 because that's when it's published. Wharton didn't read it, but Emily Dickinson and Edith Wharton are deep. I put them in the present sense. And renunciation is a piercing virtue, works, works for the depth of what's happening there. David, I see, see a couple questions in the chat and the film that Sheila mentioned, feel it's licorice pizza, right? Yes. And someone asked what we think of the <clears throat> film by Scorsese, The Age of Innocence. We were talking about that before our panel started, and um, we offered some critiques and some praise. And I'll just start by saying I think that he really got the, the vibe and the, the decor and the manners of New York society perfectly. And of course, when he was asked about the novel he said that they this is so different from what you usually do and he said well they're both gangs aren't they <laughs> and that's so true for me we we mentioned a couple of criticisms but i'll stop here and let sheila i i also I, I love the movie version very much um because i think it's so sumptuous you really sort of fall into the period um thanks to all the scenic detail in the film uh scorsese's film version when it came out in the 90s it was nominated for an Academy Award in almost every single category. I mean, including Best Picture. Uh, the actors were nominated, the screenwriting was nominated, everything. And it didn't win any of them except for Best Costume Design. And that's actually where I quibble with the film. Um, Gabriella Pascucci, who designed the costumes for it, actually made some pretty major missteps, I think. And one of them is in the very first scene at the opera where we set up the differences between May and Ellen. May is appropriately dressed. She's in her white. She has her strict bodice on and her big full skirt and she has her tool tucker. But Ellen at the opera is also wearing a corset and a bodice. Whereas in the opening scene of Wharton's book, she's wearing something that much more compares to a empire style Josephine cut gown. And it's actually scandalous that she's wearing that at the opera because it doesn't require a corset. And also because it's not the level of artifice that New York is used to in fashion of its time period with the kind of over the top decorations and things like that. Um, Newland Archer's uh, sister later compares it to a nightgown that it's almost like she's showing up there naked. I mean, she's really, really pushing convention there, but it gets everybody's attention and it starts all the tongues wagging. But unfortunately, that's a detail that didn't make it into the film. Speaking of costumes, um, <laughs> in, in the opening of the Age of Innocence, it's um, Lawrence Lefferts, who is the um, womanizer, who's so interested in uh, taste and ar an arbiter of taste, uh, if I have that. He says, I wouldn't have thought the Mingots would have tried it on. And then the, that's a line that's repeated. Uh, uh, because the scene at the opera is not only uh, of Christine Nielsen, uh, it's, it's Ellen Olenska. And if people had known that she was going to be there, whether she's there or not, and every social scene becomes this drama, her absence is as important as her presence in, in any of the, the scenes of the novel. I'm tempted to talk about licorice pizza I'm controlling myself 
here. That, that might be another um, episode, David, if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we did mention just- I both agree that the color of the hair makes a difference because yeah, you can- Scorsese uh, got the colors of the two women's hair wrong. And we said for uh, different reasons, but all of us said it's very important that Ellen be the dark, sumptuous beauty that she is in Wharton's novel. There's a question about the ending of the novel. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just read that, by the way, just so that it can be there for, well, for, for posterity, but also just so anybody who's not able to look at the Q&A so easily. From Tony Anadio, can you comment on the notion of justice in the ending? The reader might want Archer to visit Ellen and to finally achieve the happiness he has denied himself throughout his life, but by not going up to her apartment, is Wharton making the argument that Archer does not deserve her because he was never true to himself? Would it have undermined the book if he went up? To, to any and all of you. Yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes there, there's some astute observations there in that, in that question and comment. Um, one thing that always uh, sticks out to me at the ending of the book is how very deeply wedded Newland is both to his own illusions and to the idea of tradition. Even at the outset, after he's had to have his own son explain to him that his wife, May, knew for years about the relationship with Ellen and explain to him like, you know, oh, yeah, mom totally was aware of that. Something that Newland somehow missed throughout May's lifetime. Um, he's still kind of stuck in tradition and he can't move forward from it. He can't accept change. And I think one of the things that he's most afraid of is that he's going to go up to that apartment and Ellen's going to have changed, right? Because we know Ellen's capacity for change. She's demonstrated it throughout the book. So I think he's too afraid of that results to go up and face her. And it's, of course, a monumental uncovering of his cowardice as a character in the book, too. Tell her that I'm old fashioned. Yeah. Yes. Tell her that I'm old fashioned. Basically, I'm stuck in the past. Yeah. That's, 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 Part of his old fashionedness is also a tendency to be sentimental. Mm -hmm. Normally, we apply sentimentality to women in the 19th century, but Wharton is making it clear that Archer is driven almost to tears when he sees the Shogun, the very sentimental play in which the man takes the ribbon from the back of the woman's dress, holds it, he's going to lose the woman. It's really foreshadowing of what Archer's going to lose. Then he goes to uh, Rhode Island and he, he sees the pink parasol outside on the porch and he thinks it must be Ellen's. Ellen would not have a pink <laughs> parasol. Exactly. It also Archie shows how, how well he doesn't he he doesn't know her either, right? If he thinks she would carry a pink parasol. <laughs> he doesn't know her. Mm -hmm. the, end, the ending, Emily Dickinson explains the ending, even though it was published um, nine years after <laughs> The Age of Innocence was published. Renunciation is a piercing virtue. <laughs> and it it really um, understanding that. He wants to send Dallas up because Dallas, to speak to what Sheila has just said, is himself as the younger person. But Dallas is himself, who is a version of his self, of Newland's self, who's seen, um, seen all the lights of Paris. Some of the things that have filled Ellen Olenska's imagined eyes. He... Um, Archer may have seen or heard these things at a distance, but sending up his son is, is sending up himself. Meanwhile, in the movie, there was a decision uh, because of that other family saga, Dallas, from TV, not to call yeah. Dallas, Dallas. Mm -hmm. Dallas is called Teddy to the Wind. That's Wharton's husband with whom she did not consummate her marriage of 26 years, um, people say, and I indeed believe it, and I have evidence for it, um, that there is that vitality in the son who will go back and, and, and stand as Newland before her, that he can, as his younger self, be the person who's lived 
the life that he has not lived all of these years. Thank you. Oh, sorry, so if there's no follow-ups um, on this particular question, um, I would then go on to the next question from the audience, uh, which is from Daniel. Could you please speak of the critical reviews of Age of Innocence at the time of its publication? And I'll just push that. And you know, what generally did people think of it? What were the perceptive reviews? Um, what were the influential reviews? And I suppose, what were the imperceptive reviews, which we ought to know about, I guess, particularly if they were influential? I think of Kate Chopin here. I'm sorry that I keep trailing off to others. I found so much of Chopin in The Age of Innocence this time as I read it, particularly the fairy tale elements of The Age of Innocence. I think that the review of The Awakening that uh, was so um, mistrustful and said that it had positively unseemly truths, unseemly truths, that might be one line of the criticism, but the problem is an audience for that criticism. Randall, David Randall? Yes. Spoke of Auchincloss. Yeah. It strikes me you might have something to say. Sorry, I'm sorry, of the critical reviews or, 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 yeah. or the, or the uh, influence thereof, or the influence of Wharton? influence of Wharton and how he wrote about her because he's one of the most sensitive writers of the yeah. early period. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna to be too specific here, but I, I can say that people appreciated her understanding of the class of people she grew up with. And they were very sensitive to her being a New York society writer. And in fact, those um, responses led the way for the entire critical reception of Wharton for a long time, such that her first major biographer, um, R.W.B. Lewis, um, helped to give the impression of her as a grand dame of literature. And this is a, 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 a true and important part of her identity. But the later critics, came to understand she did have a very hot uh, extramarital affair in her 40s. She did understand passion. She was writing from a place of great knowledge and uh, experience, unlike say Henry James's novels appear to be. And that's a person she was always compared with. So the early reviewers were putting her, keeping her, I would say, in a category as almost a disciple of James. And it was later that we came to see, well, Wharton also wrote novels about poor people, Ethan Frome, The Fruit of the Tree, um, that she could have a greater range than what people initially saw. I just, I just want to interrupt to say, I don't think it's an insult to be compared to Henry James. I mean, it may limit the understanding of her, but my gosh, that's, that is a great person, a great novelist to be compared to. And I, I'd say there's no yeah. shame in that comparison. No, that's true. But she was struggling to get out from under, despite the fact that they were best friends. They became best friends. She had a room in her home in Lenox, Massachusetts, the Mount, called the Henry James Room, where he stayed. So, you know, I, I don't mean to say that uh, the comparison would harm Wharton in any way, but she did feel under the shadow of that label. Um, like on the subject of reviews, um, one thing that I think is interesting is, you know, how I was saying before that this is a novel that really rewards rereading. And sometimes when I've thought about the reviews that were published upon the publication of the novel originally, I look back on those and I, I see people who didn't quite have the time to reread the novel um, or even make sense of it in all its glory before they issued opinions on it. And I'm thinking of Vernon, Vernon Parrington. Um, his review of the novel when it was published in 1920 was that um, 
it's inoffensive. That was kind of his line. He he actually praised it for being inoffensive. He says, the great thing about this is that it's a novel of manners and it's not trying to change manners. It's actually representing manners the way they are. And I'm like, man, did we read the same book? You know, <laughs> um, but I think that later on, you know, um, was when we was when Wharton really started to get the readers and reviewers that she deserved. I feel like it even took a while for people to see the novel for what it was really going for and for all its myriad stories that are kind of folded into each other. And of course, for its angles of critique and humor, too, um, that some of the initial reviewers missed. And then I also think of the um, the scandalous way in which it was marketed at the time too. So when the Age of Innocence first came out, it had a you know a paper jacket on the hardback edition that had a very um, inflammatory image of a young ingenue looking girl. Um, and then it said, was she justified in seeking a divorce, right? And it put that D word right there on the cover to be like, come read this scandalous novel. So of course people like Vernon Parrington come to it and they read it and they're like, oh, that wasn't so bad. <laughs> So maybe throwing them the scent off slightly of what Wharton was going for. In, in 1904, uh, before the um, before the New York trilogy in 1905 began with the uh, House of Mirth, uh, the feminine note in fiction put Wharton together with James, and and th this was. Um, the feminist critique of, of uh, what were then known as regionalist authors uh, was that they, they were realist, that they made traps of actuality rather than having the more fantasy fiction or ways of imagining some kind of future. But in the feminine note in future, no, no <laughs> in fiction, the feminine note in fiction, uh, what Wharton is described as is as a minor, note really in uh, the psychological novel. So what it's looking at are the novellas such as the touchstone before that. But I believe that may be the first time that the psychological novel is used as a term in criticism. So it's that, so there was always a knowledge that she was doing something deeper, but 1905 with the House of Mirth um, in a sense changed everything and the way that she she was seen and known. I want to ask a novel, a question. The great American urban novel. Um, is she the first great American novel novelist of the cities or one of them? That, you know, how should I put it? A great number, a great number of the great American novels are, you know, it's Moby Dick, it's off at sea, it's you know, Mark Twain, you're off you're floating down the Mississippi or what have you. Yeah. Um, is she the first great novelist of the American city? And if and how should I put it, is she not has she not unfairly not been regarded as an urban novelist because it's not, you know, there aren't sufficient, you know, factory accidents and so forth in the novel. William Dean Howells is one of the forebears of the city novel. Um, and she, she, I think she's better than Howells. She, she is, sense. although Howells was certainly doing it um, first, right? He was doing it before her. And and other authors too, like Stephen Crane in Maggie Girl of the Streets and, and other novels from the 19th century were really kind of exploiting the idea of realism within the context of the city. Um, so Wharton is not among the first urban novelists of realism, but she might be among the first great ones um, because, you know, as the 19th century becomes the 20th and cities become an increasing part of American life and also a kind of backdrop for American life, she writes a novel about the growth of a particular city that ends up becoming emblematic for America and for American culture. And I think that's one of the reasons that The Age of Innocence actually sticks around is because the things she describes are still there. We still have Central Park. We still have the Metropolitan Museum of Art. We still have the Metropolitan Opera, things like that. They were just nascent at the time of her writing it, or even just nascent at the time of her imagining back in the 1870s, but are now institutions that we have lived with for over a century. I think the term urban is really interesting here, as David Randall puts it out, uh, because we can think of New Orleans, we can think of novels that happened in cities, and of course, Howells and um, so many others. I think of a short story, and it take, uh, Man of the Crowd, um, Edgar Allan Poe, 
as being one of the one of the great harbingers of what will happen, mm -hmm. uh, harbingers of the threat of standardization, as Wharton has it in her piece called The Great American Novel, published in 27. Um, just, I was just thinking back to when is the urban, when does the urban make its um, entry into American letters? And of course that doesn't take place in America. So that's one of those um, small issues. <laughs> Uh, nor does the Age of Innocence entirely. Uh, part of it takes place in the imagination of Italy that is so firmly present in the book uh, as a place that people don't go to. Uh, that power of the book of not going to Lake Como because he could not see May reflected there. I'd like to go to the most recent question simply because it's a somewhat long question. I wanna make sure that you have time to answer it. Uh, this is from Betsy Vandenberg. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'd like your thoughts on Ellen's comments about the beauty of family life that Archer doesn't recognize, but that she does. And also Ellen's refusal to run away as his mistress. She says she's seen the shoddy destination so many of the couples who run away end up in. Do you see some nuance in Wharton's themes that she sees some value in the old times and doesn't completely reject them? That the novel is more complex about always moving forward with change? Mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and then from the question, there's some rather long quotations, which I'm not going to you know, read out loud if you want to look mm -hmm. at them. But you know, can, can I jump of, in? Yes. It's yes. so wonderful that Betsy quoted those lines because for many readers, they are the whole book. He wants to get away. She says, you cannot escape society or as Candace put it, culture. Human nature and culture go together. You cannot get away from them. Um, as far as how this does or doesn't allow for the change and the rebellion that I was getting at, you just have courage to break away. There's an, another very strong strain in Wharton's work, and it comes from her deep reading of Darwin. And it is a, uh, an idea about the evolution of, of the species. And when I said that May is the one who continues the race, there is considerable import to that function from an anthropological point of view, if from nothing else. And if you read Wharton's novel, Summer 1917, you'll see a very sad situation. I don't know if I should give it all away, in which continuing the race trumps a happy marriage. And that's what happens in the Age of Innocence. So it's almost as if she's working, not quite primally, but biologically, Mace hits her target because she's the one who's gonna have children and the race continues. Now it's true that this white, rich New York society is on its way out, but Wharton's getting at something a little deeper, which is how human beings replicate. <laughs> I really appreciate this question and also the quotations that went with it, very helpful, so thank you. Um, and I think this is one of the moments in the book where we see simply that Ellen is just more worldly than Newland, um, that she has seen more of life and of the world and that he is relatively quote unquote innocent in his own protected kind of conservative position in New York society. So he imagines that there's some future for them where they can run away and flaunt the traditions of society and maybe even the expectations of their family and be happy. And she says, there isn't, because there is no place that exists without those pressures. That is the world that we have created. That's the world that we live in. And I've seen more of it than you have. So I know that that's the case. And one of the questions that I think the novel poses over and over again is, you know, what are families for? What is the function that they play? We see that they, um, you know, provide chains of inheritance in this world, that they provide chains of privilege. But one of the things that they're also for is to provide a kind of social context in which rejection is not as cruel and not as complete as it can be in other instances. So, you know, Ellen ends up being sort of eliminated from the situation in New York by her cousin May, 
but she's still part of the family. She's not kicked out. She's removed from it. And society can be very cruel to you if you are without kin or without family or without people on your side. She remains in the library. Uh, uh, Ellen Olenska remains in Newlands library with the uh, East Lake furniture and the sincere chairs and tables. Um, I'd like to mention what could have happened in this novel. There are outlines for the novel in the Baniki Library. And almost all of the outlines include Florida. Florida is a place where Henry James went. Wharton never went. Wharton went as far south um, as the outskirts of Washington, D.C., maybe and into Washington as a child. And then she went to Detroit and does not mention having gone to Niagara Falls. So these are the <laughs> sublime uh, absences or in, in the imaginary of how she could take a steamer and not think about the falls or mention the falls in her life. So this uh, place that is imagined as Florida, there are many different endings to this novel. This is the one Wharton chose. Uh, she chose to take the dream of romance and put it in books of poetry in that thrill of reading, which is also talked about uh, so much in the novel, what it means for Newland to open a new book uh, and the smell of it and the look of it and how much more powerful that is than the idea of May as an ice princess made fashioned out of snow and ice, uh, made to be broken by his lordly pleasure. This is a paraphrase. I'm just speaking to you all on the screen. Um, it, that being, uh, so that those, I think that those outlines, which do suggest uh, that Wharton imagined other endings, <laughs> including uh, risque Florida, uh, the, um, which if I'm not mistaken, yeah. one of the outlines for the ending of the novel that she rejected does have Archer and Ellen going off together and that relationship sours. So there's a theme in her work about um, running off not fulfilling your duty to whatever marriage or commitment you've made, that it will eventually disintegrate. Again, it's just not worth it. And that way you might say she, her vision was a little restricted. She didn't imagine the free flowing marriage and divorce of today. She always felt that there was some kind of penalty Thank you. Okay, uh, so I'm going to assume there's not another follow up on that, on that momentary pause. I'm going to go to a question from Darlene Hunzinger. Uh, when May and Newland wind up at the same little cottage on their wedding night as Newland and Ellen ha had met previously, is that supposed to show that May and the family have full knowledge and set that up on purpose? Twenty and all. I don't imagine that it's necessarily on purpose, right? It happens because they're supposed to be staying somewhere else and then the house that they were supposed to be staying in, right? It doesn't work out, it's not ready for them so that they get the Patroon Cottage as it's known instead. Um, and I don't think it's on purpose, but it's it's one of, um, at least from the character's perspective, but it's one of Wharton's um, delectable ironies. She loves doing this, right? Of reminding Newlands of the inevitability of the social circle that he exists in and how things kind of get around in that circle. And also of this kind of like tight little net that he's in where everything relates to everything else and everybody talks to everybody else or is related to everybody else and it all kind of hooks up there. So the scene where he imagined embracing Ellen for the first time and then doesn't get to, right? because Beaufort shows up and ruins everything. But he imagines the first kind of romantic interaction between them in that moment when they have that moment alone in the Patroon Cottage in the snow, and then he returns to it for his wedding night is a cruel irony to him. It's reminding him of what could be, 
what could have happened and also of um, what he has now consigned himself to, you know, by marrying May. Imagining pipes bursting in rural New England <laughs> in uh, April and early Easter April, it's uh, quite, uh, it's a reality, not just a plot device. But meanwhile, May does say, Ellen has said, this is on the only house that she could feel entirely comfortable in, that in which she's been. And so May has that knowledge. She says that as part of the, of the honeymoon, um, or I use the old fashioned word. In Florida, May does offer to release Archer knowing that someone has his attention. She thinks it's the married woman he has had an affair with. I don't think at that point she knows that it's Ellen. So I would say she is often on guard. But she doesn't until later in the novel have something very specific and significant to worry about. Thank you. I am going to go to a question then, um, oh, a somewhat depressing question from Richard Hobby. I believe that both the House of Mirth and the Age of Innocence are about male impotence, the inability of men to act effectively to do something good. <laughs> do you agree? Certainly metaphorical impotence, yes. <laughs> um, I think that's, that's a big major theme in both of those novels. Um, both of those novels, men, like Newland and also like Lawrence Selden in The House of Mirth, they have more power than they think they do or more power than they're willing to actually put to good use. And so in both cases, they kind of hem and haw and they sit back. I mean, Newland actually imagines when he's in that patroon cottage with, um, with Ellen, he actually imagines her making the first move. He sees her as the agent that has to kind of set their romance into motion, even though he doesn't really know what her feelings are yet, because they haven't really talked it out yet. But he imagines her coming up behind him and embracing him, and that will start things. He does not imagine himself doing that. And I think that's really critical. It kind of shows his um, willingness to be sort of passive in that situation, but also to retain this fantasy that if she acts first, then he's not the one who's being disloyal to his, you know, fiance, right? Um, it's someone else acting and his kind of going along with it. I think that's a fantasy that grips many of um, Wharton's male characters, that somebody else will make the move for them and then they can just go along with it. Mm -hmm. This is true at the Pagoda, Sheila, as well. Um, it, it, he is waiting for Ellen to turn around and practices the magical thinking of where, where the boat will go across their shared vision mm -hmm. and uh, what will cause him to turn around. He waits for someone else to decide his fate. Meanwhile, if people are interested in this, uh, the... Uh, weak man, <laughs> the insufficient man. I don't think the impotent man has been written uh, in terms of Wharton studies, but I think it may, it, it does have some purchase inside uh, the critical corpus. I think it's insightful that to see who moves, who sees, who speaks, who does not. It's Wharton's wonderful subtlety and in some ways consistency because things happen again. I should mention Ralph Marvell because in each of the, um, <laughs> of what could be called the New York trilogy, that man exists. <laughs> the one who might be eaten alive by culture or carnivorous figures. If you're waiting for me, I, I concur. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> passivity, how passivity is a theme. You see it in Lawrence Selden in the House of Mirth as well. And um, sometimes it accompanies a severe judgment of women. At the same time, a failure on the man's part to step up. We call that stepping up. 
thank you. Yes, I'm trying to wait to make sure everybody gets a chance to speak. Um, I, I'm going to go to a question from Jennifer Tower. Tougher? Anyway, uh, can you explore Ms. Wharton's feelings about America in general? Any thoughts on the character of Newland Archer being based on Winthrop Rutherford? For any and all. Um, Wharton had a complicated relationship with the, uh, the nation of her birth, right? Uh, she, though she was born in the United States, she was whisked away from a young age and spent much of her childhood um, abroad living in Europe. And she didn't return until the 1870s. So the period that she's documenting in the Age of Innocence is actually the first real glimpse that she ever had of her native country as a child would have been concurrent with that time period in the 1870s. And of course, um, as anybody who's read any of her autobiographies know, her first thoughts on her home nation were um, related to its unbearable ugliness. She saw it as just aesthetically um, a disastrous sort of place. Um, that was not organized by aesthetic principles in the way that um, Europe was, and she lamented those things about it. Um, but I think, you know, part of what the novel itself gets into, too, is that American society has its virtues, and she recognizes that, um, that it is organized along different lines than those of Europe, not always better lines, but certainly different ones. And sometimes those different lines can present new opportunities for people. Um, so she is often talking about the sort of um, inbuilt clannishness that exists in families in Europe. Um, you know, so there's the great desire for Americans who are uh, upwardly aspiring to go to Europe and to catch uh, husbands or uh, marital matches with people who have titles, right, to secure those titles. And this is where Winthrop Rutherford comes in, because actually that was happening in his family and also in the family of the Vanderbilts, who he was involved with, right, because he had an ongoing affair with one of the Vanderbilt um, daughters. And she ended up marrying um, a noble from Europe because the Vanderbilts wanted one of those titles that they could cozy up to and then claim as their own as well. As well. And I think that's something that Wharton definitely critiqued about Europe and saw as being something that Americans could productively seek to get away from if they would just stop fetishizing the old ways of Europe. And that's where we have Ellen say, it's stupid to discover a new country just to recreate it, right? Thank you. Um, the attitude Wharton has toward the French can be instructive here, in particular um, with respect to women. If we take Ellen Olenska to be a kind of uh, representation of Wharton herself, uh, both in France, both interested in similar kinds of culture and so forth, then we can use her writing French ways and their meaning to see what she says about women in America being in the kindergarten, but women in France being grownups. And she elaborates that quite a bit uh, in, that, in that book. Um, and she felt, I think personally, that she could grow up and be a grownup in France. And so it's an interesting reversal of the usual migration where the um, Europeans come to America for a new land. And let's remember the protagonist's name is Newland, new land, but he doesn't, as Candace was saying, really embrace the new. And um, sometimes Wharton has this reverse migration going on. And I think she may have gotten it a little bit from Nathaniel Hawthorne in The Scarlet Letter. She admired Hawthorne greatly. You remember Hester is written out of the book also, the way Ellen is. Pearl, back to Europe. So I think she's saying, as Sheila opened the comments, that the United States just isn't ready for a powerful, dynamic, beautiful, intelligent woman like Ellen. And we might also think like Wharton. Wharton was very serious about architecture. I'm speaking to what Carol was saying just now. She was very serious about architecture and um, and structure. And I, I mentioned earlier those one sentence line openings that <laughs> recur from time to time often and that just snap one into presence in the age of innocence. It's Wharton's first book co-authored the decoration of houses. 
uh, where she revealed so much about her sense of of uh, what Sheila was calling the ugliness or the disorder and the dishevelment in some ways, or the ugly brown, I'm about to use the word brown twice, the ugly brown brownstone. Um, as we think about all of this, she even critiques colors there. She dislikes colors called ashes of roses. So there's some critique of the past in terms of even colors in uh, the decoration of houses, but also she favors a decoration of houses that is architectural, that is clean, that might even be somewhat like Newland's study in its own way, even though that's not the study that she uh, surrounded herself with. But I find it interesting in Wharton's work as a whole that lawyers uh, struggle <laughs> Lawyers struggle in the Edith Wharton's work. They're, they tend to be ineffectual um, figures. But lawyers give birth, as folly gives birth to children, <laughs> uh, lawyers give birth to architects. And I think in a sense, I've never written about this in particular, but it seems as if Wharton is creating art for the next generation of men. And that she does that in allowing these sons to become architects, um, as Dallas is in the Age of Innocence. Uh, Newland and May's son Dallas is an architect. Thank you. Now we've gotten to, well, it's 3.31. I would at this point ask if I could have each of you just you know, have a concluding statement of you know, a minute or so, you know, stuff for the audience to take away. And then I just do a quick wrap up for um, our present, our, our, web, our webinar for the audience. Um, I guess same order, um, Professor Liming, if I could ask you to speak first. Um, there's a quotation by Wharton that um, often gets repeated on like, you know, it's inspirational messaging um, that says, be unafraid of change, insatiable in intellectual curiosity, interested in big things and happy in small ways. But I actually love the way that this novel in particular encapsulates so many of those points. Be interested in change because change is inevitable. You can't hide from it. Be happy in small things as Ellen is. Ellen has this kind of... Um, dumpy little house that she moves into when she first gets to New York, but when people come to visit her, they're overwhelmed with what she's done with it, with how beautiful and comfortable and sensual it is and how happy she seems to be there, right? And she really kind of makes this nest for herself and really sort of claims it for her own, and everyone's so impressed by that. So even though this, you know, inspirational saying of Wharton's that gets passed around a lot in popular culture um, seems divorced from the context of the Age of Innocence, I think we see her actually working on these things all over the fiction that she wrote, including here where she continues to tell us that if you hide from change, guess what? It's coming for you anyway, so. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Singlay. Um, well, I'm not sure this will be entirely optimistic, but she did say the world is a welter and has always been one. <laughs> and when my students say, can't we please read a novel by Wharton with a happy ending? I give them that quotation and with it, all of the embracing of change as Sheila said, and the living life to the fullest with one's creative gifts that one can muster because that's what she does with this welter that she's given. And finally, she tells us money, status, privilege, new gowns from worth do not fulfilled life make. She was not fulfilled until she pursued her passion, which was to write stories. Her society didn't think great literature was important to make, but she did it. So she followed her convictions. Thank you. And Dr. Wade. People sometimes think that because Wharton was from an uh, elite society that that made it easier for her to write. And I think that what my colleagues have been saying and underlining is that that's not true. This was such a, a, a deviation from what 
would be expected in her world. There's a reason why the Bronte sisters are <laughs> out there on the moors and have a, uh, have a, a religious background in terms of their father's profession. There's a reason why George Eliot's um, father was a, an estate manager. There's something about things opening up, letters opening up for people. I want to go back to Ellen Olinska's uh, little place, her little house and the Cartier Excentrique uh, and her dividing of the Giacomo roses uh, to speak of what it meant for Wharton, for Newland Archer to walk into a room where books were read and books were open and on the table what the life of the mind, the um, uh, having citizenship and the uh, world of letters meant to Edith Wharton, what reading meant to her and how that's conveyed in her writing. So I'm going to close with an aspirational <laughs> request. Uh, if you go to the website, provided <laughs> along with this, you can hear uh, the Age of Innocence being read aloud. I want to suggest to you to read from the book first and then go to the, um, go to this oral gift that we're being given uh, for the Age of Innocence. I want to suggest that you read all of Wharton. There's so much time. Um, I'm about to quote Willy Wonka here, and I did see licorice pizza. Um, so that this is a, this is something that will enrich your lives as it has all of ours. It's timely, and it's uh, ready, so ready to be read. And Wharton imagined in her ghost stories people reading letters and other things written by women after they were dead. So she imagined you, all of you who are here on this Zoom call, she imagined you reading her book and her books. Thank you. And thank you so much. And thank you so much. Thank you, all the panelists. Thank you, the audience. You, the, you the audience, are who we do this for. You make it possible by your questions. We are grateful to you. Um, we are grateful to our panelists, but we are grateful to the audience. Um, just a last little bit of housekeeping. Um, so to repeat, uh, if you didn't get your question answered, if other questions occur to you, send them to me, randall at nas.org, R-A-N-D-A-L-L at nas.org. I'll be glad to forward your questions to the audience. This will be up, this recording within 24 hours on the National Association of Scholars YouTube channel. Um, now, looking forward, I just want to mention that we are continuing to have our webinars. Um, we are doing, gosh, uh, The Great Gatsby, I think that is next uh, in the Great American Literature Series on September 13th. Uh, we're also doing a you know, History of Technology webinar series as well. Um, the next one for that is going to be the Age of Rail, I believe. And, oh, I'm missing the, the oh yes, Age of Rail, September 22nd. So we have two webinar series. Everybody is encouraged to listen to both of them. They can hardly equal uh, our three panelists today, but they'll try their best. Um, and I guess I would say, if you like this, it, it, uh, just a plug, National Association of Scholars, we look for members, if you care to join us, uh, because, you know, among other things, we support stuff like this. Um, so anyway, that, that is the plug for membership. But I will just, uh, having said that, say, it's been a pleasure. It's been lovely. Thank you all so very much.